Well, let's get more on the announcement now. Several experts are calling it another wasted opportunity. I'm joined by Tessa Khan, a climate change lawyer, and Tom Greatorex, chief executive of the Nuclear Industry Association. Uh, Tessa, if I come to you first of all, I know you're not in favour of nuclear, but a lot of people say that is the answer. Why do you believe it's not the answer? Well, Simon, to be honest, I think, you know, the main crisis that it was incumbent upon the government to address in today's strategy is the energy affordability crisis that is going to push two and a half million households with children across the country into fuel poverty as a result of the increase in our energy bill price cap last week. Um, and the failure to make that a central concern of this strategy to implement the measures that in the short term will make energy affordable and therefore accessible to millions of people across the country is a huge failure. And nuclear energy um, doesn't do anything, new, big new nuclear power plants doesn't do anything to address that really significant crisis that's facing so many people. Uh, Tom Greatorex from the uh, Nuclear Industry Association. We, we've got these uh, plans announced today, but we all know it takes a long time. Uh, how long is it going to take for these new plants to come on? Well, the, the plants that are under construction and the ones that are in different stages of planning can contribute to the uh, decarbonisation target we have under the six carbon budget in 2035 and the net zero target by 2050. So it's about investing in the infrastructure that ensures we have a secure, reliable, low carbon mix from different sources that minimises the amount of uh, reliance we're going to have placed on gas. And as we've seen, um, in the last few months, the uh, volatility of those gas prices is what feeds through to consumer bills and to underlying features of the economy, like the inflation that, um, that, is, that we've got at the moment. So it's about ensuring that we have the right long-term mix. And that's what's uh, positive about today's announcements. I completely agree um, that it, none of these things that are announced today will deal with the immediate issue, but what they will deal with is preventing the same circumstances having the same impact that they're having at the moment. What about planning, Tom? We know what the, the planning process is like in the UK and, you know, not many people want a nuclear power station on their doorstep. How much of an issue is that for you and your colleagues? Well, it's not so much the planning process as the speed of the range of different things that have to happen. This is true of offshore wind as well as it is of, of nuclear, that, that type of infrastructure. The approval processes that need to, need, you need to go through take longer than the construction period. So if we're serious about wanting to get that low carbon energy capacity built, then we need to look at that and avoid some of the duplication and some of the delay that's happened. And that's some of the issues which are, are covered in the paper. But you know, in terms of the, the line about not wanting a nuclear power station at the end of your street, there isn't going to be a nuclear power station at the end of your street. The sites that will be used will be sites that currently have or have previously had nuclear power stations in the main. So it's um, that's not the same issue in the way that it's presented, really. It's not about something where there hasn't already been nuclear facilities. But the, the process takes far okay. too long at the moment, and, yeah. and that needs to be dealt with. Tessa, what would you uh, like? What, what do you think are the missed opportunities today? What do you think are the, 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 the big wins that they could have gone for over the next two or three years? Well, I think there are three very clear ones. The first is you know, as I said, to address this crisis of energy affordability, um, there is a massive mistake on the part of the government to not invest in a huge rollout of energy efficiency measures that can cut people's energy bills in the short term. So whether that's, you know, insulation measures um, or other ways to fix the fact that the UK has some of the leakiest, draftiest housing in Western Europe. You know, I think that has got to be a priority and that is something that is ultimately going to materially impact people's lives in the coming months. Um, the second thing I think that there's a broad consensus was a real missed opportunity in this strategy is a failure to really expedite and commit to increasing our onshore wind capacity. Onshore wind is now the cheapest form of energy um, that we have available to us. It is uh, four to six times cheaper than gas, Yeah, for but that's example. a planning and issue so as well, isn't it? A lot of people object to that. Well, it, they object to it because it's an incredibly stringent process for getting these um, new onshore wind projects 
approved. So just one person in a community objecting to it is enough to put a stop to the whole thing. And actually, a lot of recent polling has shown that there is a wide level of public support. People understand that it's a clean form of energy. It's much more affordable, um, certainly, than the fossil fueled alternatives like gas. Um, and so I think, you know, that we have vastly underestimated actually the appetite of the UK public to support those projects. Um, the final thing though that I would say, and this really picks up on Tom's point about the need to rapidly shift away from gas, which is the thing that is driving up energy bills at the moment, is that the UK government today committed to a new licensing round for offshore oil and gas extraction, which is a huge mistake. Um, it is something that will take, it takes on average, according to the government, 28 years between an oil and gas license being issued and yep. it leading to any oil and gas coming out of the ground. So that's one thing. But more importantly, Very it quick. is completely contrary to our ability to stay within a livable climate. This week, we heard from the world's experts, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that we can't have any okay. new oil or gas projects if we're going to respect those uh, livable climate Tessa, limits. thank you. Tom, just how do you reassure people who are worried about nuclear waste, the disposal of nuclear waste and the safety? Well, it, 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 briefly, how, how do you reassure people? Well, look, most waste from nuclear power stations is completely benign. It's steam. It's not pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, as it happens if you burn gas for electricity. Um, there is high-level waste, which we have to keep. But, you know, for the entirety of all of the power ever produced by all the nuclear power stations in Britain over the last 60 years, that's equivalent to a dishwasher tablet for every person in the country. So it's a small and manageable thing, and we manage it, and we will continue to do so in the future. The most important thing is that you're providing electricity to power the country without adding to the climate crisis and that's what nuclear can do alongside other low carbon sources to get to that better balance mix with predictable pricing that's going to be good for the economy and good for the environment as well and tessa you reckon we can do it on the sustainable uh method just briefly do you how much of the uk's energy can be got from solar wind and tidal well i think there's consensus that you can definitely have a functioning energy mix um a power grid that relies on 75% renewables. At the moment, we are closer to 40%. Um, so there's a long way for us to go in terms of really maximising the potential of these abundant, cheap, renewable resources that we have on our doorstep. Um, but the technology, the storage technology, the renewable technology, all of that is getting both cheaper and better at delivering um, on-demand energy. So, you know, in 10 years' time, I think we can be much more ambitious yeah. about the role that renewables play in our energy mix. Really interesting. Thanks very much to both of you for your time. Tom Greatorex and Tessa Carmer. Thank you.